Cool. With with your thoughts on on Jeff Robinson passing away, the news coming through um, uh, early this morning that the wild man of rugby league, a, a cult figure throughout my time growing up watching the game, has passed away at the age of sixty six. Yeah, that's very sad to hear. He um, he uh, he's been battling cancer for a while. The great uh, the great Jeff Robinson. So um, very sad day for the Bulldogs and. Uh, yeah, he was he was a he was the definitive cult hero, old Robbo, wasn't he back in the day? So very sad news. Yeah, a hundred percent. I had a big discussion yesterday with our listeners about your article in the Sydney Morning Herald, and around about the bunker and Wayne Bennett and what he had to say and what's a try, what's uh, sorry, what's a, <laughs> what's a try, what's a sin bin, what's a send off, what's a penalty these days. It was a really interesting sort of health check on the on the game itself as well. Um, just give me a, a, your snapshot of that article and, and the reaction to that from, I guess, NRL headquarters. Well, I, I'd spoken to Andrew Abdo and Peter Volandis on, on Sunday, actually, about Wayne Bennett's article. I thought it was interesting that uh, the Wayne said it in the first place. He, I know he can be quite a cantankerous uh, old coach, as we know. He... Um, but he, he's not one to bag referees. He'll, he's got plenty of views, obviously, Bennett, on the game. But he's always into his players about blaming the referee for a for a, for a loss. So um, it was very premeditated, his interview with Paul Crawley on foxsports.com. Uh, he called Volandis before telling before uh, the, the article was published. So, so Peter Volandis, who's actually on holidays for a week, uh, knew it was coming. The NRL internally were a little bit surprised by it before, for the very fact that, which I pointed out in that piece in the Herald yesterday, that uh, the, the NRL are actually working on, and it's quite sort of secretive, I, I didn't realise any of this until the weekend, that they're working on uh, not so much a rules revolution, but just trying to streamline the game and, and not make it so dependent on the bunker and make the bunker rulings more consistent by having a crack team of Top Gun bunker officials. Um, I don't know how big that team will be because it's lo- quite a lot of them don't seem to have any idea. But uh, uh, it, I, I found the fact that, that that they have been working on that and also talking to Bennett about it. Yeah. Because the, the Landys and Bennett have such a close relationship, which was forged during the COVID nineteen lockdown. So um, they were surprised by by what he had to say. But when Bennett talks most people listen so i think he raised some valid points i wasn't entirely on the same page as um bringing a player back on after 10 minutes if he gets sent from the field uh that sort of flies in the face of him saying that the 10 minutes in the sin bin should only be applied to professional fouls in some respects but um but i think what wayne was saying captured what many people who follow this game are frustrated with and it's it's the maddening inconsistencies from week to week from decision to decision um, and I think that's that's something that the NRL really need ahead of all the other about expansion about taking the games to Vegas about all the other little sort of things that they want to they want to do with the game I think at, at, at the very basic level they need to sort their rules out in the interpretation of those rules is there I, I know you've said this quite often around the the money that the game has, you know, that the financial state of the game is very good. And a lot of what's been going on in the bunker and rotation and all this kind of stuff is, is because that they don't want to invest even more money on getting that crack team. So are they prepared to spend money to have a, a team there that's there for every game or thereabouts? Is, that, that's you... the, that, sorry, sorry. Yeah, that, that's the impression I got from, yeah. from Andrew Abdo. They were very cagey about it, Matty, I've got to say. They were very, very cagey about it when I spoke to them at the weekend. But it seems like quite a lot of work's been uh, being done behind the scenes. But also, I think they're cagey because it's not going to be implemented until next season. So they don't want to be start talking about uh, changes to how their match officials adjudicate the game until they're probably set in place, which is fair enough. I, I understand that. But, um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I, the whole idea of getting rid of the two referees happened during... Uh, the COVID-19 lockdown, and part of that was money. They were, they were talking about funding. Well, the game's flush with money, and you'll find plenty of people in the game, and I know the great Andrew Johns is, is an advocate for it at the moment, about re- re- bringing back two reps, particularly if you are making so many critical calls around set restarts to do with the ruck. Yeah. Um, it's, the game's never been quicker. 
and those calls have never been more influential on how the ga- on the on the on the tempo of the game. So why would you not consider bringing back two referees? I think it's um, I think that's something that might be on the agenda. Uh, again, it's, the details are sketchy, but the main thing I got out of it was they're looking to try and fix the problems of the bunker. The problem with that is that that doesn't matter who it is. If they get a Top Gun team, whether it's Maverick, whether it's Iceman, whether it's Goose, whoever it is, they're still human beings who are going to make decisions that other people aren't going to agree with, no matter who they are. And do you know that, um, just on the back of that, it's Tom Cruise's birthday today. Just oh, Happy birthday, Tom. I yeah. know you would be listening in. That's right, 61 Oh, you years know what, today. Tom probably... You know what, Tom, Tom probably tuned in to listen to me at nine o'clock and got Paul Parker. I'm like, oh, where's, where's Webster? This has ruined my birthday. <laughs> you know, he's probably just jumping up and down on a lounge somewhere going, wow, Corey was really good. That, that bloke's been benched until 10. Um, I just thought I'd throw that one in there. It's a really interesting one, and it makes you wonder which way it's going to go. But the one word that was in your article yesterday that everybody's been saying and that obviously the NRL are hearing is that, is that they understand, most people, Webby, understand that humans can make errors and humans are going to be in charge of the technology at the end of the day. So I think, you know, pretty much everyone's got a grip on that, but it's the inconsistencies. that That's what gets people, and if they can do anything around that, then they should be. I just think, the, I think the referees are confused about when to apply a sin bin and when not to, or what, what's, what deserves a player to be, to be, um, to be, you know, when, when like the origin was a great example, I thought, um, and I highlighted that in the story, and yeah. I think more than a few people have highlighted the madness of, of both Luttrell and Liam Martin being put on reports for a high tackle and a dangerous throw, respectively. Then Liam gets marched for a head rub, and I know it was off the back of what had happened in the melee. The melee. Can we redefine what a melee is? It's an aggressive cuddle. That's what it is. Um, uh, uh, from the from the set before, but. Uh, you know that's where that's where people are confused. Why? What, what did the what did the listeners have to say yesterday when you were raising it? I'm interested to know. No, it, pretty much. If there was a general point of view, it was it was exactly that. It was let's work out a way to have consistency in the decision making. That that's it. And and then off that was the tangents that you've just mentioned. Okay, well, you know, I, I had one caller who said who said to me, "Well, hang on a second. The best referees should be in the bunker." Because now we're, you know, then they can pass judgment. So, <laughs> that's right. But that, that's the well. You know what? That's a very valid point. And to me, that's the problem with the game that we've taken all the authority away from the guy in the middle. Like that's like surely the player, the, the sorry, the referee on the field has the best feel for what's happening. On, on, in the middle of the ground, not necessarily what the bunker's seeing. And I know the bunk, the technology is not going to go away. And as Andrew Abdo explained to me on Sunday, neither is the HIA. So if you're going to take yes. a player off for a HIA assessment and have him off the field for 15 minutes, then isn't the player that caused that HIA to be um, in the first place, Does he, should he not be sat down as well? So I think there's... Like, it's complicated. I'm not trying to say that I've got all the answers to it. And it's, it's, you're never going to please anyone at all. But that's the thing that I think fans get confused about. It's like, well, why is he in the bin for 10 minutes and he's not? And that could happen numerous times in the one game. I think that's where it's become very um, confusing. The other thing, though, too, Maddie, that I, which I alluded to in that article, which absolutely shits me to tears is the amount of diving, staging, whatever you want to call it, in the game at the moment. It is... Rugby League always used to pride itself on not being, quote-unquote, soccer. They hated it, you know? And I've heard coaches talk about it. I've seen other coaches take take on other coaches um, about it many, many times over the, the last 20 years. Mm. But the current system encourages players to either take a dive, to feel the back of their neck for a crusher, or stay down if they've got some incidental contact from a high shot or or an arm that slipped up uh, uh, in a tackle, or they take a dive in order to get get an obstruction penalty against the other team. And I just think that's that's a part of the game that's crept in uh, and the NRL has allowed it to creep in over quite quite a long period. At the end of the day, though, if you want to get rid of diving from the game, that starts with the coaches and the players. (laughs) So um, 
it's on them as much as anyone. Oh, 100%. I remember when it started to creep into the game, and I was very vocal about it on this program, and I said, do you want to be that player that, that milks penalties, that does the lie down, that turns rugby league into, like you say, into soccer? And the, the reality of all that is, if you're not, then you you know the video session the coach is saying why why weren't you why weren't you getting us a penalty there I mean that the game allows for that so play to it so it's a it's a vicious circle and it's a big big point Chad Townsend's uh, signing rubber stamp to come with the Roosters at roughly two hundred fifty or three hundred thousand dollars there or thereabouts has raised a few eyebrows when you look at it from Chad's point of view gets another year in the NRL. This is the discussion I had with Corey as well. Um, the, the Roosters get a very experienced half, a good backup if that's what it's going to be. But is it going to be that? And does the money add up? Uh, it's a lot. Um, I, where can I start with this? I know the Roosters have been looking for a backup um, half for some time. I know they've got other, they've got some in the system there, but they want a strong, experienced half particularly with Luke Keary going at the end of this year. I know that, that they were very keen on Sean Johnson, um, and he just offhandedly said, no, that's we, I don't want to come. Uh, I don't know with that, whether that might have changed, given what's happened with him at the Warriors in the last uh, last month or so. Um, look, it's a, I, I have to say I'm surprised. Like, he's right at the end of his career, and it, it is a good little whack of money for uh, a 33-year-old. Is that how old he is now? Um, it's mm. It's... It's an interesting one, but you know the Roosters. The Roosters have been a little bit funky with <laughs> with their recruitment uh, this year. Uh, after going after the feeder and it falling over, um, finally signing or extending Angus Crichton. But yeah, look, I suppose we'll know next year whether it's a good signing or not. But it's uh, he's a handy player to have, particularly one with all that experience and, and also one who has won a grand final. So let's not under, underestimate uh, Chad Townsend's abilities. Yep, one three hundred oh one eleven seventy. the Alltel open line. On the text line, Webby, from Andrew from Percolbin, uh, up there in wine country. Can you ask Webby if he thinks the second ref should control the ruck only? The problem last time was yes. different interpretations of the 10. Yeah, that's right. I think that's what, that's what, um, what Andrew Johns has proposed and others have proposed as well, like the, or the the pocket referee, for want of a better term, being there and, and controlling the ruck, and the other ref controlling the ten. Like as, as it stands now, it's the it's it's one of the linesmen control the uh, judges the, the the ten meters. But if you had two out there, and given the speed of the game, and also as I said before, given this, there seems to be so much uh, subjectivity around whether it's a six to go or not with a ruck infringement, like. In, in the origin in the origin match on last Wednesday night, there were Queensland. I think got pinged for ruck infringements twice in the one set. Now, if you and I watched a game of football, I reckon you could almost get do the same thing. You could probably get three a set if you were fair income. With some, um, it, it's a matter of interpretation. I think if you had more consistency around the one referee in the pocket making those calls, then you'd probably have. I think there'd be more clarity around um, around set restarts. Yep, yep. Uh, Andrew points out, too, in the Top Gun references, uh, Goose carked it in the first one, and Iceman was like Joe Biden in the second one. So a <laughs> bit of a worry about the, about the Top Gunners that are heading... I'm talking to... old school. All right, I'm talking about old school. <laughs> one, hey, 300. I don't, think Goose, I, don't think, I don't think Goose was to blame for his deaths in the first one. Oh, well, no. As we saw in, as we saw in the second one, Maverick was to blame. <laughs> And that's this morning's movie review with Andrew Webster. We're going to take a break. It's approaching 20 minutes after 10. one 300 You know that number, so give us a call if you'd like to speak to Webby. Wednesdays with Webby right here on SEN.